We're in this new series. I'm glad you're here, a part of the journey right from the get-go, because I'm really excited about this series, Blue Christmas. How many of you here have ever experienced a white Christmas, like a snowy Christmas? Anyone here? Anyone? anyone? I am so jealous. We talk about, some of you who haven't experienced it, you probably do the same thing. My wife and I would love to and talk about one day being able to experience a white Christmas. Christmas and to be able to experience the snow in that. One day we're going to be able to, but in this time of the year, it's not, you know, very white and pure, although it, it can be. Um, but for many people, it's a blue Christmas. And it's, it's a Christmas that filled with um, moods and depression. And for some reason, this time of the year, this month even, this Christmas season, there are more suicides in December than there is in all the other months combined. And so we want to design a series to maybe meet some of these real needs that you could be going through right now. And this message today is called the holiday blues. And clinically speaking, like clinical terms, the blues is the lowest form or the, the kind of the first stage of depression. They really, so it goes from blues just being, and we all know that Elvis made it a little famous, famous, right? The Christmas blues. Okay, blue Christmas. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But that's the first stage. And then the second stage is um, a mood disorder is what they call it, where you're just a little bit more moody. And then the last stage is just full-on depression where a lot of people are experiencing. I really believe that this is an epidemic in our country. And it is, I believe, the number one health concern of our country is depression. Now, I want you to know right off the bat, I did some studying on this because of just the nature of it. There was a pastor several months ago who took his life in Southern California. And some of you guys may have read that story or heard that, that story. He left behind three kids, a wife, a grieving church. Um, and, and every time there's like a, a mass shooting or something, we hear about mental illness and depression, and it always comes up. So I, I decided um, several months ago that I was going to educate myself on this topic. And I want you to know right off the bat that I am not a therapist. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a specialist in this area. I am a pastor. And what I want to do is I do want to bring you God's word. I, I, can, I can lead you to a God who can heal you. Amen. But I do want to give you some things that I've kind of researched and discovered. And, and um, one of those things in this TV, I'm going to move it because it is way off track. Now it's in line. Thank you so much. There we go. One of the things I want you to see, depression, is this. It's a mood disorder characterized by this word, anhedonia. And anhedonia is, is uh, it's the inability to experience pleasure. So the things that used to, used to please you and you would experience pleasure, it just doesn't work anymore. Extreme sadness, poor concentration, sleep problems, loss of appetite, and feelings of guilt, helplessness, and hopelessness. So when I, and I, when I read this, I thought, my goodness, this is all of us. At one time or another, to one degree or another, we all have to experience this type, these types of feelings. And I was doing some research. One out of nine people in our country are currently on depression medication. And this is not like an anti, we're not anti-medication or anything like that, but I'm just giving you some, some facts. I want to help navigate you through some of these very real feelings and, and, and this very real topic. One out of nine, though, are currently on. One out of five people have taken depression medications. And in fact, it's, it's, uh, depression medications are 300%. It's a 300% increase right now and still climbing. It's a huge deal right now. But one of the problems, probably like one of the big problems with this issue is what I think is there's a huge stigma attached to it. There is. So if, if, if when we tell someone like we're sick, if you get sick, if you have any type of physical illness, you get sympathy. And I was, and I got sick just this last week. So I got a lot of sympathy. People were like, oh man, I hope you feel better. Oh, you're going to be all right. You get the cold, the flu, sinuses, whatever that is. People go, oh man, you're going to hope, hope you feel better. You get sympathy. But in, but when you get, when you tell someone you have a mental illness, you don't get sympathy, you get shamed. Okay? And listen, that has to stop in Jesus' name. That has to stop. We have to come to this understanding, church, that there really isn't that much difference between a physical illness and a mental illness. But really, we, it's not, listen, it's not a sin to be sick. And your identity is not in your illness. Can I get an amen, church? 
And, and what I want to say right off the bat, you guys, is like even in an environment like this, you come into church and people where it's a place where we all try to put on a little bit, right? You try to dress your best. At least you do. I come all ripped up and stuff, you know what I mean? But some people, you can't, you try to, but it's a place where, you, you know, we can try to or we can present a false image. And some people can on the outside look in and go, oh, those are perfect people. Those are people at church that have got it all together. Can I tell you something? That is not what's happening here. That is, that is not at all what is happening. I want you to know, I want you to receive this at the onset of this message. I want you to get this. And you need to believe this, that it's okay to not be okay. I want you, you, you got you to gotta, you gotta understand this and believe this, you guys, that it's okay. Because if, if you don't accept this from yourself or from God or even from us, then I'm telling you, listen, then it's impossible for you to get any help. There's, there is no help if you don't believe it's okay. And I want you to hear it straight from your pastor, even if you're here today and you're kind of kicking the tires, wondering, is this going to kind of be my church and my home church? I want you to know that you have found a place where every single one of us have got some loose screws, okay? Every one of us got some issues. We got some mess ups and some hang ups. Some of us got to the hospital a little earlier than you, but every one of us, God is working on the issues. Can I get an amen, church? It's okay to not be okay. And I want to create this environment, man, where it's almost, it's normalized to express these things that are going on in the inside of us, that it's okay. That's okay to not be okay. Because if you don't believe that, if you don't believe it's okay, then you'll hide it. And you'll tuck it in. And what, I, what I've discovered, you guys, is that that's actually where all the problems come from. It comes from the dark place, the secret place. When you don't, when you try to act like or pretend like it's not there, God cannot heal who you pretend to be. Come on, somebody. Say amen. So the question here is like, what's happening? Like, why? it's an epidemic, man. It really is huge. And what is going on? Why do we find ourselves in this situation? And in my research, I found out, this is news to me, but I found out that this, this, this issue <clears throat> is largely a lifestyle disorder. It is. It's a lifestyle-related disease or disorder. In fact, one of the guys that I was reading, his name is Stephen Alardi. He authored this book here, The Depression Cure. He's actually the uh, clinical psychologist at the University of Kansas right now. I watched some of his videos and read his book, The Depression Cure. He said this, We were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food-laden, sleep-deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. Hey, that is us right there. And we were not designed to live that way. You know, this fast food, uh, computer, at your computer desk most of your day, you know, busy schedule, out the door, you guys. Listen, he said it's reforming our brains, literally rewiring how our brains, we were not wired by God to do this, to keep up with this. And then you add on top of that. These are my thoughts. I just want to, I just want you, you can take it or leave it, but these are my thoughts. You add on top of that, the cell phone and social media abuse and mis, like I, I believe it is out of control right now. It's out of control. It's, have you ever heard of um, phantom notifications? That is a real thing. Uh, have you ever, ha <laughs> you don't got your phone in your pocket, but your thigh just vibrated. Or you keep your phone back here and you're like, oh, and that's a phantom notification. Or you hear, I heard a vibrate. There's a vibrate. Where's my phone at? Where's it out in the house? And, and come on, that's a phantom notification. That's the thing. And our kids are being raised on iPads and iPhones instead of out in the dirt like they're supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> And, and this is, look, they did some research on this, and every culture where the people spend more time in sunlight and out in the dirt, there is less mental illness. Okay, this is, this is an epidemic, you guys. And then you add on top of that the lack of identity happening in our society. It has been discovered, a fact, that, those, that, that mental illness doubles with those who deal with a sexual lack of identity. It doubles. That's a fact, you guys. Okay, and, and they're calling their babies, they're not even calling their babies, they're calling them babies. Babies, because they want them to be able to choose their gender, a gender neutral term, for, which baby is a gender neutral, ter neutral term anyway. They're just sowing confusion, but, but that's, you add on top of that a lack of identity, but then add on top of that the inability to process pain today. The, people don't know how to process pain. The way we process pain today is we medicate it, or we, we eat it away, or we watch 
TV in a way. So we, we binge eat, we binge drink, we binge watch, and it's not helping. It's actually adding to the problem. It's adding to our pain. And then you add on top of that the peer-to-peer mentoring, where we are getting our advice from our... <laughs> You got, I would not be where I am today if I were to listen to my 15-year-old counterparts or my 18-year-old counterparts. I wouldn't be on this stage talking to you if I listened. It wasn't, it wasn't God's plan. Now, I'm not saying that you can't get advice from those who are younger or from peers. I'm not saying that. But God always designed it for elder to mentor youth, that there would be an open vehicle. And I'm really encouraging and challenging you elders to get involved in the youth. But we have this going on. And then you add on top of that just our narcissistic culture. It's all about me, selfie. <laughs> Try to get the, you know, you got to get that going on. I don't know why you got to get that going on, okay? If I see, I'm just telling you, if I see one cleavage in your selfie, you're off my wall. You're out, okay? I don't keep you. Bye, Felicia. Okay, but it used to be, I can prove it to you, the front side of the camera used to be like a, a, a throwaway, you know? But now it's like megapixeled out and flash, and you can even zoom it in and out. And now we used to keep pictures of everybody else. We used to pay, collect pictures of everybody else, and now we collect pictures of me, my outfit, my look. It's just our society. It's just where we're at, you guys. And before I get into God's word, I want to briefly talk about what some people do with all this, okay? And this may not be you, it may be you, maybe you're, I don't know what, what, where you're at in the spectrum of, of, of depression and stuff, but what some people do with all this is they choose to or they consider ending their life. And I want to talk about that. And we don't talk about it enough, I don't, I don't think, and I did want to address that, okay? Because one million people in the world a year end their life. 30,000 people in America every year in their life. It is twice the murder rate. It is, check this out, it is the number one killer of kids 15 to 24 years old. Number one, all right? Suicide is a permanent, irreversible attempt to solve a temporary problem. Our emotions come crashing in like a wave, and, and, and I got news for you. Listen, just like the emotions came crashing in like a wave, they will recede again. Those emotions, you don't have to live by the emotion of the moment. And you definitely don't have to end your life. You don't have to die to end your pain. Can I get an amen, church? You don't have to. In fact, as I was doing this research, uh, one of the people I was reading and watching was Rick Warren, the pastor of Saddleback Church here in Southern California. Um, very awesome, amazing pastor and man of God, and he had his son commit suicide. He dealt with depression. And so he talks about it a lot and writes, has written about it a lot, and every time he talks about it, he shows this number, and I wanted to show it to you guys as well, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. If you know of anyone or hear of anyone thinking about considering taking their life, I want you to take a picture of this or write this down. Share this number with them, 1-800-272-TALK, and they will be connected to someone who will... uh, Talk to them about the wrong solution to a very real feeling. It's a very, very real feeling that's, that's going on. Okay, now to God's word. I want to bring you God thought, God's thoughts on this subject. God's, God is not silent on this subject. I want you to know that. And actually, there's a lot of the Bible that covers this. In fact, there is a lot of the great people of faith that dealt with very tormenting, very distressing, very depression type feelings. In fact, there is a whole book of the Bible that is committed to depression. It's actually another word for depression. It's called lamentations. And it's a whole book of the Bible that Jeremiah writes about his lament, and he's depressed, and he's he's pouring it out. And in one portion, Lamentations chapter 3, let me just give you one portion of this entire book. Jeremiah says, I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten. And that's the problem right there. That is a key word that he forgot. He wasn't remembering the right things. He'd forgotten what prosperity is. And some of you here today may have forgotten what prosperity is. You may have forgotten what it feels like to be on top of or ahead of life and things like you've been under it for a long time, maybe under that cloud or under things, and you have just forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. He said, all my hopes, my hopes are gone. Check this out. He says, I remember my affliction. 
in my wandering. And that was a problem right there. He was remembering the wrong things. The psychological term right here for this is ruminating. You can look it up. Ruminating is, is a condition we do to ourselves where we just get alone. We don't allow any outside voices in and we sit and think. And we start creating our own narrative and believing our own lies. It's ruminating. It's very close to the, to the word uh, that cows, the word with the cows uh, of how they chew, cud. Cows, when they chew cud, they'll chew it and they'll, they'll swallow it down into their intestines, but then they'll regurgitate it back up and they'll start chewing on it again. That's just like ruminating where you, you just bring it back up again and you're like, well, they do, they do think about me. Like, they don't believe in me and, 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 and my mama is and my daddy is and my boss is and, and life is and I'm just, and you're just, you're remembering the wrong things. You're, you're, you're focused on the wrong things. And he says, the bitterness and the gall, I well remember them. And check this out. He says, and my soul is downcast within me. Well, no, no duh, Jeremiah. You were, of course, going to arrive there because you were remembering the wrong things. Are you hearing me today, you guys? This is Jeremiah, the, the prophet of God, the apostle Paul. He says it like this in 2 Corinthians. We don't want you to be uninformed. And God doesn't want you to be uninformed about this. It's, he doesn't want this to stay in hiding or in secret. And the Apostle Paul is being an example and a model for us, saying, guys, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about all the troubles. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to act like, oh, I'm the Apostle Paul. I got it going on. No, no, no. I want, I want you to see this part of me. I want you to see what's really going on. All the, all the, the I was in, he said, such great pressure far beyond my ability to endure it, so that, he says, I wanted to end my life. I, I despise of life itself. I just, and so, I really think that we need to deal with this head on. And one of my, one of my goals in the message today is just, is just to get you to this place like, hey, it's okay, it's okay to not be okay. Like, we don't think it's strange at all that you're having any of these feelings or any of these thoughts. It's not a strange thing. It's a lifestyle-related disease. And until we stop hiding and bring it out into the forefront and say it's okay to not be okay, then you're never going to experience freedom. And that's what God wants for you. And that's your right in Christ is freedom. And we have, um, just by way of announcement, we have this starting next year in our next season of small groups. We have something we're starting every Tuesday night that we're calling Freedom Night. Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. Not only is Celebrate Recovery going to be offered, not only that, but we're going to offer not just addiction stuff, but anxiety, depression groups, grief groups, um, a lot of different. And, and we'll start with worship. And then we're going to go and separate all into different places, different rooms, depending on where you need to experience God's healing and God's freedom and freedom. Freedom is going to be the expectation. Amen, church? Yeah. We're believing that. We're believing it. So I, I want to kind of, to help teach this story, I want, to, I want to use Elijah's story to help me teach this, you guys. Because Elijah, in, in 1 Kings chapter, we're going to read 19, but in 1 Kings chapter 18, was recorded one of the like greatest victories ever was recorded in 1 Kings chapter 18, where Elijah had this God standoff with the 400, picture it with me, you guys, 400 false prophets, prophets of the devil, prophets of Baal, and this one prophet of God, Baal. Elijah says, hey, let's have a standoff. Let's both make sacrifices and worship our God, and let's see which God responds and shows up. And so these 400 prophets, they cut up an animal, they make their sacrifice, and they just do their chanting, huh, 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 and nothing happens. Nothing. Nothing. But Elijah goes, he makes his sacrifice in his altar, and, and he says, you know what, why don't you dunk, dunk it in water, make it to where it can't even burn naturally, and God showed up in the midst of that. They, and he consumed with fire that altar and that sacrifice. And, and Elijah put to death all 400 false prophets by the sword. And he came off of that this highest high moment of his life. And then he gets to 1 Kings chapter 19 and he experiences his lowest low of his whole life. Which, which tells us and teaches us something that your lowest lows don't usually come when you're experiencing a low time. Your lowest lows usually come on the heels of a great victory, on the heels of a God moment. That we're, and I'll tell you why. It's, it's because we're living emotionally. 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you. So let me, let's read it. In 1 Kings chapter uh, 19, starting in verse 1, it says, Now Ahab told Jezebel, the, the king and the queen, everything that Elijah had done in, in chapter 18 and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like one of them, those prophets of mine that you killed. And Elijah, on the heels of this great victory, he saw what God has done, scared to death. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And it says, when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. He said, oh, I need to be alone right now. And listen to me, Elijah did not need to be alone right now. That was a mistake. But while he himself went a day's journey out into the wilderness, far away from anyone's support, anyone's help, anyone's counsel, he came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. For some of you, that's your theme verse right there. You, for some of you, probably said that recently. I have had enough. He said, take my life, Lord. I am no better than my ancestors. Four quick things I see in this text. Take some notes with me today because I think at the root of all mental illness, especially depression, it, are, are these things, especially this first thing right here, write it down, is faulty thinking. Faulty thinking. Uh, it's stinking thinking, okay? The Proverbs say, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Faulty thinking leads to faulty living. We get, we, but we get into this ruminating process. We got all this self-talk going on, and we rehearse the negative things and the wrong things and the bad things. And listen, you cannot breathe the air of negativity and expect to live in an atmosphere of peace. You better watch out of what you're breathing and what you're speaking and what you're around and what you're allowing into your life. Philippians chapter 4 says it like this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things because the devil is lying to you. If you just could get the words of God and the wisdom of God and the presence of God and hear the voice of God, you can experience God's peace. Like today, I don't care what you came, you could have came in feeling the blues, the moods, depression. You could have been under it. you feeling it. Today, in Jesus' name, you can leave with God's peace. You can. In Jesus' name. The second thing, the second thing, we, we, in our, we already said it, but I want you to get in your notes, is that he went and isolated himself. And isolation, listen to me, is a dream killer. Everything is worse when you face it alone. And some of you guys, you're isolated. And some of you go, oh, no, I'm just, I'm sitting right next to someone. How many of you know you, you, you don't have to be alone to be lonely in heart? And some of you are, are lonely. And listen, maybe you're, even if you're not lonely relationally, listen, some of you are lonely in your thoughts. Where no one else knows what you're thinking. You're just, you're just, you're the only one you're listening to. Can I tell you something? You are the last person you need to be listening to when you're in this condition. Okay. You're the last person. You, you can't trust yourself. You can't trust your emotions. Your emotions will lie to you. You can't. You can't. You can't. You can't. That's why here at Discovery, we preach it all the time. You need to get into a group. You need to get into it. And groups aren't like, we're not, we don't talk about groups so much here at Discovery because we're trying to build a small group empire or something. Look, it's for you. You need to get into around some other believers in your life that you can actually share. You can take off the mask. You can stop hiding in secret and say, this is really what I'm thinking about. This is really, and it's okay to not be okay. That's the whole reason of groups. And some of you guys are still alone in your thoughts, but if you do that, you just watch. God will start healing your life. Small groups are not a luxury. They are a necessity. They're a necessity. You have to have somebody in your life that knows your secrets, okay? If you're the only one that knows your secrets, you're in trouble. And you don't need to tell everybody, but you do need to tell somebody. Somebody needs to know what you're thinking because the devil will take advantage of that dark place in your life. He'll exploit that place. Ecclesiastes says it like this, chapter 4, verse 12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. And that's what he wants. He wants you isolated on that island so you can be defeated. But two can stand back to back and do what? And 
conquer. Some of you, you guys, you, you need to stop living like you are satisfied and content by surviving when God has called you to conquer. You need to st- look, look, some of you guys are just, you're satisfied that you survived the day, that you didn't have a panic attack, that you, didn't, you, you got out of your room that day, that you didn't want to kill your husband. Or You guys are satisfied with, but God has called you to conquer things. God has called you to conquer the devil, conquer your negative emotions. And he says, if you can get around some people, you will conquer those feelings. You will conquer the enemy. Then he says, three or even what? It's better to get into a group. You need somebody watching your back. If I'm, if I'm facing this way in life, I got blind spots. You need someone watching my back going, hey, hey, watch out. Okay. What? What's that? You, got, you need some people in your life who got and have your back. Groups, 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 groups. Get in a group. You need, it'll save your life. Get into a group. Here's the next thing we see that Elijah was being. He was being led by his feelings. Led by, he got there and he trusted the wrong things. And I said it before, I'll say it again. You, your feelings will lie to you. You cannot trust your feelings. Emotions crash in like a wave, but they will recede again. And by the way, that's just not the bad emotions. That's the good emotions too. You cannot live your life based on your emotional highs or your emotional lows. You can't. You, you cannot trust those things. It's the good in it. You can't live your life based on the, oh, all the good. You're, you can't live your marriage based on emotional highs like, oh, look at her. She's so beautiful. I love her. Look at her. Look at her. Oh, she's amazing. How many marriage, married people? Help me out here. That don't stay there. Come on, somebody. That don't stay there. That's going to recede again, okay? You don't, live, you don't live your marriage on roses and chocolates, right? You don't. You live your marriage based on commitment. You don't live your life based on feelings. You live your life based on truth. And God's word is truth. And Jesus says, and when you know that truth, that truth will set you free. It'll set you free. Look, stop the whole ruminating process and focusing on the wrong things and the negative things. He says, if you can just focus on my word, I can get it freedom into your life. We're thinking about the wrong the wrong things. And then, remember, he said, I'm no better than my ancestors. Why do we, why do, we do that? Why do we play the comparison game? Why do, we, why do we compare lives? And now with social media, we're comparing other people's highlight reel with our low moments, right? No one ever, no one is as good as their Instagram, all right? Nobody is, no, no one takes a picture of their kitchen all jacked up and messed up. No, they take a picture of their remodel that you can't afford that you're going to go try to do now because you saw they had it. Come on, somebody. Will you just receive that, okay? Stop it. Stop it. It's just, and nobody's as good as their, their Instagram, you guys. But listen, this will bring you some peace. You, you only have to live to please one person. One person. And when you live to please God, he will make even your enemies live at peace with you. Galatians chapter 1, 10 says it like this. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? Am I trying to be liked or get the like clicks? Am I trying to win or of God? Or am I trying to please people? Because if I were trying to be a people pleaser, I would not be a servant of Christ. He said it's impossible for you to be a people pleaser and a God pleaser at the same time. You can't live to please people and serve God at the same time. So in Elijah's story, what happens next? Let's continue it in verse 5. Watch, watch these words. I want you to see this. It says, Then he laid down under the bush, and he took a nap. He fell asleep. All at once the angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And I want to add to that some butter. Come on, somebody. For all you paleo people, this is the word of God right here, okay? All right? And check this out. Check out what happened. It says, strengthened by that food. Strengthened by that food. Oh, no. Did I skip? Back it up. I did. Go back. Go back. He ate and drank. Because this. Check out what he did. This is so important. I'm glad I didn't miss this. Check. He ate and drank. And then he laid down and took a nap again. Come on. That's my, that's my verse for today. That's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to go home. I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to get me some food. And then I'm going to put on a football game. I'm not even going to watch. And I'm going to just fall asleep to it, okay? That's going to happen. And then when the kids get the remote and try to change the TV, I'm going to be like, I'm watching that. <laughs> Look, some of you need to learn what a Sabbath rest really is. 
A Sabbath isn't giving God an hour on your Sunday. It's the whole day. Come on, you guys. What you, you don't just give God the service. You need to just take the whole day and cease from your work. Take a walk with your wife. Hang out with your kids. Go take a nap. Get something to eat. Take a nap again. All the men said, amen. amen, somebody. Come on, women. Amen, right? So then he continues. It says, strengthen. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night. You can go read the rest of that on your own time, you guys. But let me just kind of summarize it for you. The rest of that whole chapter, God shows up in that cave. And he, and he, show, he actually did three like majestic, powerful things. He, he caused an earthquake and then, and then a fire and then this great wind. But then there was this, the Bible says, a gentle, still small voice, a whisper. And the Bible says God wasn't in the majesty and in the greatness of those earthquake or the fire or the wind, but he was found in that moment, that small moment, the whisper, the gentle whisper of God. And then after that, um, God says, Elijah, now I got some things for you to do. I want you to get up. I want you to go anoint that king. I want you to anoint him for, for, for the work. And then, and then I want you to go find Elisha. Elisha, he's going he's gonna to be your protege, and I want you to build a relationship with him. And Elijah, I got some work for you to do now. Um, I'm not done with you. And in the final verses, I see four more things that I believe is the solution for anyone in this room who has the blues, who is maybe feeling depressed or wherever you're on that scale, like, like I believe that God's word has the solution for your healing. And I, I, can't, I can't bring you healing, but I can bring you to the God who can. And this is, what, this is what God did for Elijah that I think he can do for you. Write these down. Here's number one. And that is, he, he got Elijah healthy physically. He said, eat, sleep, eat, sleep, take, take a nap. Get healthy physically. Go get some sunlight. Get into an exercise routine. Call someone for accountability and work out together. Do what you got to do. Get something to eat. I'm not talking about fast food, driving with your knee with a hamburger kind of thing. No, like go have a two-hour meal with your family and have a conversation with your kids. Get healthy physically. You'll be surprised how much is connected to that physical, how much of your emotional health and your spiritual health is connected to your physical health. The greatest gift that you can give the world, family, is a healthy you. It's to get healthy. Psalm 127, 2 says this. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. Oh, if I work a little bit longer, maybe if I put in some hours today, make a little bit more money, I'll... Oh, really? How's that working for you? Are you, are you happier? Working your tail off? Are you happier? Is your family more better off? For he grants... What's this word? He grants... Sleep. sleep. To those he loves. You may think that this is weird, but I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that today you would experience the best sleep that you have had in a long, long time. In Jesus' name, I speak sleep over your life. Get healthy physically. You got to get healthy. And then he got into that cave and he had a conversation with God. He started talking to God. And if you go read the story in the text, a lot of what he was telling God was just stuff that wasn't true. He was, remember, he was ruminating, creating lies. And so he was saying, like, I'm the only one that's serving you, God. There ain't no one that's serving you. And when the fact was, we come to find out that there were 7,000 others who hadn't bowed their knee to Baal at all. And a lot of what Elijah was saying was just nonsense to God. But God did not condemn him at all. So this, this is what you need to do. You, we need to all get to this place where we can pour our heart out to God. To pour out our heart to God. Listen, God can handle your mess. God can handle your issues. God can even handle your lies, and he'll listen to them. you got to get to this place where you can pour out your heart to God. You don't need to be perfect. You can't keep it inside because the devil will take advantage of that dark place in your life. David in the Psalms was a great example of this, pouring his heart out to God, but he would always get back to this place, like in Psalm 62, verse 8, where he would say, Join me, everyone. Trust only in God every moment, not just in the highest of highs, but in your low of lows. Trust God in every moment. Tell him all your troubles and pour out your heart. Pour out your heart longings to him. And then this is going to happen. Look, he says, believe me when I tell you, he will help you when you do that. And then it says, pause, then pause in his presence. And in a moment, we're going to 
we're going to end this service a little bit differently, and we're going to have some worship. And we're going to, and, and we're going to have an opportunity to pour out our heart to God and then to pause and let God pour back into you. And I want you to get in a rush, but, but here's, here's the third thing we see in the text, and that is he experienced both things, the power and the presence of God. And we work really hard here at Discovery for you to experience both of these things, for you to experience, man, the power of God, but for you to also hear the still small voice, the whisper of God. And I don't know any other way to do that. Like you need to, you need to do that in your own life. You can't just have that on Sunday. And I don't know any other way for you to do that than to, you gotta, you gotta get to a place where you turn down the world's volume and you get alone with God. You have to have that in your life. It has to be in your life to get God's power and presence. And I don't know what it looks like for you, but for me, it's a little office. I have, I have some blinds. I open them up. Man, I turn on some worship, and I get into my word and pray, and I watch the birds on my bird feeders. And don't judge me for that, okay? You're laughing at me then. Fine. But I just get alone. I get alone with God, okay? You need to get alone because it's only then. In Psalm 46, he says, be still, comma. And know that I am God. Almost to say, you can't know that I'm God until you get still. Be still and know that I'm God. If you give God your attention, I promise you, he will always exceed your expectation. Here's the last thing I see in the text. And, and I'm just trying to help you to pull you out of this mindset, to pull you out of this, this depression that might you, or even the blues that you might be in. And in my opinion, this is the... This is the, the number one health problem in the world. We need to do this, and we need to let God give you a new purpose and a new direction. A new p- purpose shifts perspective, church. Purpose shifts perspective. And there is nothing more that brings you know, meaning and healing to a life than an assignment from God. And honestly, this is the best way I know how to pastor you. I mean, because I can't bring healing into you. I can't heal you. But the best way I know how to pastor you is to get something in your life to, that, is, that has mean, get something in your life that's bigger than your life. And we don't have next steps and a dream team and a dream center to serve out and stuff just because we're trying to build a church building. No, I'm trying to build a you building. Like you need to get purpose and direction from God. It's the best way I know how to pastor you is to just get you close to God. Let him give you purpose and direction. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says it like this. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. I mean, it, get out of the ruminating. Get out of your self-talk, man. Let somebody else into this. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Though outwardly, Paul says we're wasting away. You know, I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked, poisoned. Yet inwardly, he says, I'm being renewed day by day. Paul, how do you do that? What's the secret? For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. He said, yeah, I still got hurts and problems, but I got something else in my life. I got purpose in my life. I got direction in my life. I have a hope in my life that far outweighs this moment. This cloud, this pain. No, no, no. I don't live like that. So what do we do? He says, we fix our eyes. Faith will fix your perspective. We fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. He's saying, man, this is just temporary here, but I'm living with purpose, with direction, and eternity. I've got something greater in my life. I want to end a little bit differently. You guys, I don't want you to stir or miss out on this. I don't want you to leave because then I got some more things to conclude with after we worship. But I'd like to spend some time pouring our heart to God. I don't know what you need to tell Him today and what you need to just confess today and what you need to just pour out your heart to Him. And I'm telling you, He will begin to heal you today and bring you peace today. And then we're going to pause in His presence. Lift your hearts and hands. We receive this prayer. God, I pray right now that you'd bring light, bring life, bring hope in the midst of our darkness. God, I pray that this moment right now would be a catalyst of healing and freedom. That right now, God, we're beginning to get our lives in order, reprioritize, reshift, that things are getting healthy in our lives. Thank you, God, for what you're going to do. God, we have these moments that we pour our heart out to you. 
that we're going to pour our hearts even out to others. We're going to get into community. We're going to get into a place where we can share and take off the mask and not hide in the secret place. And we're going to experience your presence and your power and know, God, that you are real and that you are good and you have power to heal, God. I pray that it would happen right now. And God, I speak purpose and life and direction. And no longer are we going to live this life aimlessly and wandering. God, give us a new purpose and a new direction. In Jesus' mighty name, with every head bow, every eye closed, maybe you're here today and you feel far away from God and you want to draw close. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then he will make your heart his home. He'll change your heart, change your mind, change your desires, even change your will that he'll begin that process today. And that can happen with every head bowed and eye closed. I'm not going to have you come up to the front, but I want to pray for you right where you are, whether it's the first time or maybe you just need to come back to God. Will you pray something like this? Agree with me, church. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender the control of my life. I give it to you. I'm yours. Jesus, come live inside of me. Wash me. Cleanse me. My heart, my mind. Reshape right now. In Jesus' name. Thank you for a fresh start, God. Thank you for loving me, for cleansing me, for giving me a new purpose and direction. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said Amen. Come on, give God some praise, church, if you receive it today. Amen.